Good morning. It's good to be here this morning in this uh, in this space that we have, and I am happy to have you with us, whether you are on uh, Facebook Live watching in or on Ustream streaming this in, or even later uh, watching on YouTube or, or the podcasts. Uh, we have on on our Facebook page, on our Highland View Church Facebook page, and also on our church website, uh, we have links. Uh, Beth Jenkerson puts up uh, podcasts for each of the sermons, uh, as well as each of the sermons get uh, edited by a group and put up on YouTube as well. Uh, So there's the YouTube channel you can pull up the videos from, and you can link those from the website or the Facebook page, either one. Um, But we're glad to have you wherever you're watching and however you're watching this morning, whether you are here in Oak Ridge, Knoxville, Clinton, Oliver Springs, or if you're watching uh, abroad or in another state uh, joining us this morning, we're glad to have you. Um, We've been working through a series the last few weeks on even when it hurts, and it seemed fitting uh, giving the time. There is a lot of pain and grief and confusion and angst and anxiousness, uh, <laughs> existential angst and everything else. Um, and, and, and there's there's some school of thought, you know, to kind of ignore it or stick our head in the sand and, and, and move on, but I find that scripture gives us a great example that that's not the approach we should take. Uh, I I believe one of the most important things for us, we know, uh, as it is reiterated over and over again, the most important thing we can do is to know God, intimately know who God is. We love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our strength. We love our neighbor as ourself. In that, I think one of the most important things that comes out of that is weeping with those who weep and rejoicing with those who rejoice. And we want to be in both of those camps all the time. Um, as we are today worshiping in homes and sitting around in, in living rooms and uh, kitchens making breakfast and, and uh, campers out camping and everywhere else that people are listening this morning, uh, we, we are doing this in a way to love our neighbors and to love our family and to love our community. Uh, to be a part is painful Um, But we do it not out of uh, requirement, uh, but out of love and out of caution for uh, the well-being and the lives of of each other. And so we're glad to have you wherever you're joining us from this morning. Uh, If you want to go ahead and turn, we'll start in a couple little places, uh, but we'll spend most of our time in John 11. Most of it. Um... So if you want to go ahead and turn there, that's great. Grab a a Bible or your phone or whatever you're using. Uh, I I do love, I I use my phone uh, for looking up Bible verses. I use Bible Gateway and different things all the time. Um, And and I love it. It's an excellent resource to have. I do love having a, uh, a physical Bible and using that. And one of the reasons is it's not because, you know, it's somehow magic because it's, it's paper. Uh, But what I do love about it so much is that, you know, you can do stuff like this. You know, you can can write all over it, and you can highlight, and you can underline, and you can take notes. And I think that that is incredibly important. I think it's incredibly important for us to be able to look at these notes and see... Uh, to look back and see, you know, what we thought, what were we going through, what struck us when we read this passage the last time. Uh, I think it's a a really neat concept to think about someday someone else reading what we discovered on our journey, whether that's um, a child or a niece or a nephew or a friend or uh, whoever that is that may one day, you know, grab your Bible and and look through. 
But, so I encourage you, make notes in your Bible, write in your Bible, uh, underline things, and have that be a part of, have that be a part of what you're doing. Uh, even though I said we're going to spend most of our time in John 11, which is true, to kind of start us off, let's look briefly at, or talk briefly, about Genesis 3, uh, Genesis 5, Romans. Uh, Genesis 3 is titled in most of your Bible, you know, the, the kind of paragraph heading that we added later, uh, probably says something about the fall. Uh, this is, you know, the infamous, you know, the story of Adam and Eve and the serpent. Uh, I refer to it as the leap uh, because we, we didn't fall. We, we saw the cliff, we walked up to it, and we jumped off. Um, but in this time, one of the things, we won't get into the story, but one of the things that God had told them was, as Eve correctly says, um, you will surely die. If this occurs, if this happens, you will surely die. And there's this back and forth with the serpent about that. Here's the thing. In, in Genesis 5, um, Genesis 5, shortly after this, we're going through some, some lineage. And, and you can look at that or you can make a note, but what's important is how every piece of the lineage ends. So-and-so lived, and they marked their years, and they lived for you know, such and such number of years, and they died. This branch of the family lived such and such years, and they died. This person lived so many years, and he died. This person lived so many years, and she died. Each piece ends with a death. Romans 5.12 uh, talks about it in this particular piece. Paul is talking, he says, Just as sin and death entered the world through one man, referring to Adam, just as sin and death enter the world through one man. Death is, death is a part of this world. Uh, it's a part of our lives. And the reason why it is so hard, I believe, one of the reasons why it's so hard is it just wasn't ever meant to be that way. And so when we... When we struggle with death, it is so painful. It, 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 it opens a wound that never heals. You know, we, we say things to people who experience death. We say these, you know, beautiful little cliches like, you know, time heals all wounds. That's false. It doesn't. If you've experienced great loss, you know, time does not erase that loss. And, and I make the argument, you know, oftentimes I, I spend a lot of my life trying to figure out when that hurt would go away. And I finally realized that, you know, if I could wave a magic wand and I could make it go away, I wouldn't want to. Because those feelings, though unbelievably powerful, connect us. And it connects us to those who we have lost but it's powerful. Uh, it's, it's a feeling like no other, and it's a feeling that never goes away. It, it, it evolves. I wouldn't even say diminishes. It changes, and it evolves, and it alters, but it never goes away. Jesus knew that. Uh, in John chapter 11, leading up to Leading up to where we're going to talk about today, uh, we're going to look at the story of Lazarus, Jesus, Mary, and Martha, and the family. And leading up to this, Jesus has been in Jerusalem celebrating Hanukkah. Uh, it's kind of where we, we come in before this story. He, he's left. Uh, he's gone back, and he, he's visiting uh, villages and families again. After this story, we have this uh, one that we talked about a few weeks ago about the story of Mary um, anointing Jesus, a different Mary than the Mary that we will talk about in the story today, possibly. Um, 
but what we know is that uh, in this piece, we're de dealing with Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Now, we've seen Mary and Martha before, uh, these sisters, and it was when Jesus, uh, one of the times that Jesus was visiting. And Martha, and this will become important because I, I want us to think about these dynamic. Uh, Martha was the one who was working about the house. Jesus was there, and it says he was teaching. Martha was working about the house, whatever she was doing, cooking, cleaning, preparing the meal, uh, washing, and Mary wasn't. Mary was, it says, it's very specific, it says Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus. And we have uh, taken that and either glossed over it or just kind of, again, put our perspective on it of someone literally just, you know, sitting on the floor watching. Uh, but w what we know is that, that that saying was pretty specific, sitting at the feet of. That's what scholars did uh, with their rabbis. They sat at the feet. They were being trained as apostles. They were being trained as scholars underneath rabbis. You know, Paul, when Paul is listing out his, his pedigree, he says he trained at the feet of. Uh, and this we have Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus. So she's learning, she's sitting, being taught, learning at the feet of Jesus with other disciples and apostles. And Martha says, it shouldn't, you know, she needs to come help. And Jesus makes a statement. He tells Martha, Martha, Mary has chosen the better. Mary has chosen what's more important. And I tell that story only so we can remember that dynamic of Mary and Martha and who was, in, who, was who in the story as we go into this piece in John chapter 11. Now, John chapter 11, let's start here at the, at the beginning. It says, Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of, Beth, of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment, wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sister sent to him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When Mary and Martha send word to Jesus, the statement is, Lord, he whom you love is ill. And, and, and the word love here, and, and we can really, like, it, it becomes really tempting to really dissect these different words for love. There, there's three kind of main different words for love, and it becomes really tempting to dissect them and prove what different ones mean. And it's, it is a bit of uh, a fool's errand, because they don't always line up as, as beautifully uh, as we might. Um, I remember having, you know, in, in history class, and in English class especially, in high school, I would have English teachers who, you know, they would, they would teach these books, and they would teach these poems, and they would draw out all these conclusions and metaphor and sim symbolic nature of the book, and some of it wouldn't even exist. I remember this one uh, teacher I had in high school, and, and she spent this great uh, amount of time talking about the color yellow that was used throughout the book and the symbolism of yellow being caution on the caution light because you know we have green go red stop yellow warning you know starting to slow down on our traffic lights and she really went into this and into this and spent a good amount of time explaining how the yellow light on the traffic light corresponds with the use of yellow in this book and it was beautiful and it was symbolic and it made perfect sense the only problem was the book was written before yellow lights existed we can do this with these works. We can make things line up and we can get really excited and it may mean something and it, it may not, but 
this word that's used when they say it is they're like, hey, Jesus, your friend is sick. Jesus, this guy that you love like a friend is sick. And we can talk about, you know, guessing as to the reasons they use this approach. To me, to me, it, it feels like a plea of Jesus, listen, I know you're busy. I know you're saving the world. I know that you're traveling. I know you're healing this people. But don't forget, you love this guy, and he really needs you. Please, Jesus, your friend is dying. And Jesus responds with another love, and he says, Jesus loved in a much deeper love than phileo most of the time. Again, we're, I love language, and I love literature, and I love reading into this, and I also know that it's not necessarily the case. But either way, they make a plea out of love, and Jesus responds, yes, I do. I love. And Jesus responds with a deep Love. I deeply love these two sisters and Lazarus. A deep love. And then he doesn't go. The distance, probably 30 miles, he could have covered. Uh, could have got there in a day. But he didn't. And in fact, it goes on to say that he waited on purpose. He purposely waited, and, and not just a little. He, he waited that day, waited again, waited again, and then traveled. Four days lost. And we know in the story, Lazarus dies. And in verse 8, the disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you. Are you going there again? And Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. After saying these things, he said to them. So again, this is kind of poetic Jesus, and then he remembers, you know, his, his crowd is a little dull, his own disciples. After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to wake him up. Verse 12, the disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he'll recover. Still dull. Still not getting it. Jesus, you know, says it in poetry, and he's like, well, I'll just lay it out there. He's falling asleep, but I go to wake him up. The disciples like, uh, if he's asleep, like, he'll wake up. He's just napping. No big deal. Uh, now, Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant literally taking rest and sleep, having a nap. Verse 14, then Jesus told them plainly, had to break it down again, and third time, Jesus tells them plainly, listen, Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I am glad that I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. So Thomas, called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. Jesus, being scared for Jesus and what Jesus was going to face going back to this area. This, this, this is a tipping point. This is for another story and another detail. But this, this raising of Lazarus is a tipping point for Jesus. Verse 17. Now, when Jesus makes his way, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. And when the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother, so when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Mary stayed, remained in the house. Now, they got word that Jesus was coming. Mary stays, Martha gets up and runs, goes to meet Jesus where he is. Verse 21 uh, through 27 is an important piece 
about Martha. Now remember, Martha was the one in the story. Martha was the cleaner, right? Martha was the one who didn't go and sit and learn from Jesus. She didn't go and, and was taught in that moment. And, and, and so what we do is we take that story and we're like, well, you can run with it in either direction. But we take the story and we're like, okay, so Martha... She missed her chance. She could have been sitting at the feet of Jesus and learning, but she missed her chance, and she was, you know, dusting the china cabinet instead. That, this was not a passing encounter. Jesus didn't visit Mary and Martha and Lazarus one time for one meal, and Martha missed her shot. These were close, dear friends. Look how Martha knew Jesus. Verse 21. Martha ran out to meet Jesus, and Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. I, I, again, we, we read this however we believe it, right? So we, we read it out of how we would be. And so this is telling how I would be in this situation. I, I don't believe Martha ran out and was like, oh, Lord, I know if you would have been here, it would have been fine. I think Martha is angry. I think Martha is hurt and wounded and angry. And grief looks a lot like anger and anger hides, masquerades. And I think Martha ran out and angry and just confused, dismayed, latched on to Jesus and cried out, if you, if you, had, just, if you had just been here. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Here's the token response. Martha said to him, Yes, Lord, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. I love this encounter, deeply love this encounter, because this, this encounter happens at every funeral home, every wake, every graveside service that has ever been. The weeping family, somebody with the best of intentions, walks up and says, you will see them again someday. And it is absolutely true. If they, are, if they are a follower of Christ, you will see them again someday. We know that. And that gives us hope. And that gives us a different sense of hope than people who, who don't have that assurance that they will see one another again, but at the same time, they can't see them now. So Jesus just says, um, Jesus just says, your brother will rise again. And Martha responds how she should. Yes, Lord, I get it. I know. I know, Lord, in the scheme of things, I get it. I know one day. God, one day, yes, you've promised, and I believe, one day he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. But verse 25, Jesus says to her, I am the resurrection. I am. I am. We know what that means. We know who that is. Martha knew who that was. Jesus responds to Martha, I am the resurrection. I am the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this, Martha? And Martha says to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. This, the language here, this yes, Lord, this, this, isn't a, a, this isn't a realization. When Martha says this statement, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who is coming into the world. This isn't, she's come to grips with this, or she's come to terms, or in this moment of grief with what Jesus said, it all clicks. This is saying, yes, I have already decided that in my past. 
that has already been decided, and this situation does not affect that. I have already known you are the Christ. I know it today, and I always will. That is what's in this statement. That is truly what is written in the language. That's in the language. That's in the wording. I have already known this. I know it today, and I always will. It sounds just like the confession of Peter. Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God. Pure resolve. Martha. That was Martha. Martha wasn't the cleaning lady who ignored Jesus and never sat at the feet of Jesus. Martha knows Jesus deeply and intimately knows has known, knew that day in the face of death, and not only in the face of death, but in the face of death where she knows Jesus could have gotten there. She doesn't know why he didn't come, but she knows he could have come, and she knows that he could have kept her brother from dying. She knows all of these things, and yet she knows you are the Christ, the Son of God. And what you did or didn't do or why or why not has no bearing on that you are the Christ, the Son of God. That is Martha's confession in this moment of pain and grief and loss and confusion and anger. But even when it hurts, even when it hurts, you are the Christ, Jesus. Verse 28. When Martha had said this, she went and she called her sister, Mary, saying in private, Listen, the teacher is here and is calling for you. When Mary heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had come to meet him. When the Jews who were with Mary in her house, consoling her, when they saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, just supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep. There now, when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him the very same words of Martha, Lord, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. We don't know Mary's heart. We don't ever know in the moment of grief how anyone feels. I have experienced immense grief and loss and death. And one of the first things I tell anyone who experiences the same is, I don't know how you feel. I know how I felt, but everyone is different. And I don't know how you feel, and I won't pretend to know how you feel. We don't know how Mary felt. But I think there's a lot in that story. I think there's a lot in that the Mary who from the very beginning sat at Jesus' feet and was trained by Jesus. That Mary sent word to Jesus. Jesus didn't come in time. That Mary heard, hey, Jesus is here. He has arrived. And Mary stayed seated. Mary stayed seated. She didn't run out to meet Jesus. She stayed in the house. Martha came and got her and told her again, Jesus is here, but hey, the teacher's asking for you. Jesus, Jesus wept. wept. And Jesus weeps. He doesn't stop and tell the mourners, guys, it's not that big a deal. He doesn't tell those weeping, hey, relax, relax, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. He doesn't say, stop crying, I'm going to make this right. He doesn't say, I'm going to fix this. He doesn't say, one day this will all make sense. He, he doesn't stop them at all. He weeps with them. And this is not a moment where we see Jesus' humanity. This is a moment that we see Jesus' deity. This is Jesus. This is the character of God revealed in weeping with those who weep. When you experience great loss and great tragedy, I will never know exactly how you feel. 
I, I will weep with you and I will empathize. And I can even share some of my own experiences, but I will never know exactly how you feel in that moment. But one thing I can know for absolute certainty is that you have a God that weeps with you. Not a God that looks down from a thousand miles away and says, God, it's so ridiculous. It's a moment in time. It's all going to be better. Like, compared, compared to heaven, like, what, what is there to cry about? Like, chin up. That doesn't ever escape the lips of our God. But tears escape the eyes of our God with us. Jesus was deeply moved. His spirit groaned in trouble, and Jesus wept. So the Jews said, oh, see how he loved him? But some, and I love this, it's very telling, and it's, it's all of us. It, truly, it's all of us. Some of them said, you know, could not he have opened the eyes of the blind man also kept this man from dying? Like, some of them were incredulous. I, I believe exactly how Mary and Martha were. Some of them looking on, they were like, oh, he loved him. And some still at the same time were like, but, like, if he loved him that much, and he can make blind people see again and, and lame people walk, like, why couldn't he have got here in time and just kept this from happening? Then Jesus, deeply moved again, not angry, not uh, prideful, not, not condemning, but in that moment where it says they looked on and they thought, you know, if he can heal the blind man, couldn't he have kept his own friend from dying? And Jesus is deeply moved again. He came to the tomb. It was a cave. And a stone lay against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time, it's going to stink. He's been dead for four days. They didn't mummify like in, like in Egypt. They would wrap some and they, they would put spices on and, and, and perfume to try to help with the uh, smell for a couple of days for like a morning uh, period. That's what, you know, Mary and the other women were going to the tomb of Jesus to do, to, you know, spice and, and perfume. And... But at this point, that's all been done. The stone has been closed. And he's like, it's been, it's been four days. And, and, and there were some superstitions at that time, and, and there's no way to know how prevalent, uh, but there were some superstition, even among some of the Jews at that time, that like your, a spirit would kind of hang out for three days, uh, and, and it was possible, you know, to, to live again type thing. And, and so we're even, past, we're even past the silly superstitious stuff, right? Like, we're four days, Jesus. Jesus said to her, Oh, man, did I not tell you? That if you believed, you would see the glory of God. And I'll tell you, I, I read that statement exactly the same way that I read him talking to Peter when Peter sank. Oh, Peter, did you not know I was going to save you? I, this, this is Jesus deeply moved, not angry, not, not badgering. This is Jesus deeply moved. Man, oh, Mary, Martha, didn't I tell you? If you believed, you would see the glory of God. So they took away the stone. Jesus lifted up his eyes and he said, Father, <laughs> I thank you that you have heard me, past tense. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this for all of them. Father, I... I I don't have to say these words out loud. I knew you. You heard me already. The 
the Holy Spirit that intercedes with a groaning too deep for words. And my spirit groaned, and I know that you already know, but for the sake of these people, I'm saying this prayer out loud. (laughs) On account of the people standing around, I'm saying this that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and his feet bound with linen strips, his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind this man, let him go. Jesus walked to the tomb and he cried out with a loud voice in a command. Not in a question, not in a hope, not in a prayer, not in a, you know, uh, if you could be so kind. He cried out with a command, Lazarus, come out. And I love that it's a specific command. Most most of the tombs were multi-room. So you might, you might have, you know, an entrance into the cave and then have three rooms or, or different numbers, but t- you might have three rooms, kind of burial rooms. And each of those three rooms could be independently sealed with a stone, and, and then you could seal the outside with a stone as well. Chances are, there, there's a decent chance there were more than just Lazarus in here, but there, in that, even that specific cave but there were also chances are lots of other caves and burials in there in that place one of the things that i love about the ending of this story is that jesus is very specific he doesn't walk up to the cave entrance and say come out jesus voice has the power over death Jesus had authority over death. And when Jesus cries, come out, the grave's empty. And the dead in Christ shall rise when Jesus returns and comes down and makes his dwelling place with us. And so even in this moment, I love that if Jesus had walked to the tomb and said, come out, they would have, and not just Lazarus. Lazarus, come out. Unbind this man. Remove the cloths. And let him go. I love this story for so many reasons. One of the most moving things to me is Jesus weeping with those who weep, that our God weeps with us, and that's a sign of who God is. That, that is God revealing to us what God's nature and character is, that God weeps with us. No matter how small our plight or problems may be compared to the cosmos, compared to eternity, we we know that our life is nothing more than a... It's a breath. It's a fragment. It's dust. And even in that, what's important to us is important to our Father. What makes us rejoice makes our Father rejoice. What makes us weep makes our Father weep with us. I love that Mary loved Jesus deeply, understood Jesus intimately, had been trained at the feet of Jesus, but she had her moment where she didn't want to go see him. I called you and you didn't come. I've said that a lot. 
I've said a lot of prayers. And when the prayer didn't get answered how I had decided would obviously be best to answer, I just stayed in the house. Jesus came to see, and I, I, I'm good. You didn't come when I called, so I'm going to sit here in the house. But in the end, she, like Mary, like Peter, like David, like all of them, knew that even when it hurts, the only place to find comfort is at the feet of Jesus. So when Mary ran to meet Jesus, her first words weren't, this is the only place I can find comfort. Her, her first words were, God, where were you? If, if you'd just been here. She was still angry. She still knew where she wanted to be. Martha, in grief, in, in, in the searing moment of pain, where, where to them all hope was lost. They, they, I believe they had hope. I believe that they, honestly, I believe they probably nearly had a level of certainty that Jesus was going to keep Lazarus from dying. But once Lazarus died, and it had now been four days, I believe that hope was gone. And they had accepted their brother was dead. And so Martha, Martha had had four days. She had come to grips with the fact that her brother was dead and buried and gone. And she still knew that Jesus could have prevented all of that. And it hurt terribly, and everything about her had been ripped apart except... I knew, I know, and I will always know you are the Christ. Jesus, it hurts awful. And if we're being honest, and I know, Lord, you want me to be honest, I'm half angry at you over this, but you are the Christ. God, I don't understand why you didn't just do this thing. But it doesn't change that you're God. God, I'm mad at you, and I'm, I'm crying. I'm in the depths, and I know you could have fixed this, and you didn't, and I don't know why. But you are the Christ. Even when it hurts. even when it hurts. God, I thank you for who you are. I I'm thankful that I know I can praise you in any storm. And I know that I don't always praise you in the storm. And I know oftentimes when you don't answer, I sit in the house with my arms crossed and the tears running down my face because I don't even want to look at you. But I know, but I know that you're the only place for peace and hope. God, I know that when I, when I come running at you, angrily at you, demanding answers that are not mine to demand and, and asking for explanation that I have no right to ask for and just seeking wisdom above my pay grade, that your heart is troubled, that you weep with. God, you are God, and we are not. Father, for everyone 
listening today, wherever they are listening from. I can't give them any hope or any peace or any answers other than you. You are the sole source of peace that isn't fleeting. I can give a pep talk that'll make someone feel really good for a few moments in time, but you are the only well that doesn't require us to go back to over and over and over again trying to fill a cup with holes in it. You are the only source of peace that doesn't fade. You are the only source of hope where there should be no hope. You are the only source of constant life, light, where there's just nothing but darkness. You're the only source of life. God, help those who are listening right now, who are in darkness, who are staying in the house, whose arms are, are crossed in, in grief or in pain, or arms are crossed in questioning, and arms are crossed in anger, arms are crossed in indignant. Father, for those who are running towards you, and for those who are running away as fast as they can, help them to hear you. I know you're speaking. I know you're speaking to every single one of us. God, just help us to listen. Help us to hear. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for caring, for loving more deeply than we can ever imagine. For never walking out, never leaving, never giving up, always chasing, always pursuing. with a love that just won't let go and with a love that is constantly begging just come home you angry come home hopeless come home don't believe come home thank you father help us to see you and hear you you are there you are speaking be with everyone today god with heavy hearts Help us to rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep, and love everyone. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Love you guys.